Hi, this is Carl Leopson at the University of Arizona. Outcomes for kids with disabilities after high school can be a real challenge. Whether it's obtaining employment, getting a further education, or living independently in the community. To help improve those outcomes, the federal government required states after 2004 to report on 20 different indicators of properly implemented special education. They wanted to know about graduation rates, they wanted to know about parent involvement, they wanted to also know about transition plans, and that was indicator number 13. And so when you hear folks talk about indicator 13, they're talking about the transition plan indicator that is part of the state performance plan required by the federal government in special education. As a special education professional, you're required to help develop a transition plan for a, any child that reaches at least the age of 16 who has a disability. So we're going to look at what the elements of a transition plan are as required by indicator 13, which means that if someone were to come and check a child's transition plan, they are going to look for eight specific pieces that fit indicator 13. So here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at these eight requirements. Post-secondary goals, and that's really specific. The most important thing to remember about the post-secondary goals is that they're to be post-secondary. They're not to be about what happens in school. They're about to be about what happens after school. That they're updated annually, that they are based on some kind of transition assessment and some data, that there are services associated with those goals to help kids achieve those goals, that there is a course of study included, or the high school courses that a student's taking that help lead to the child achieving those goals, that there are IEP goals that are aligned to the transition goals, and that there's evidence the student was invited and that there's evidence of coordination with outside agencies. And then we'll take the opportunity to do a little practice. So let's take a look at some of these individual pieces. And the first one is writing post-secondary goals. Just like any IEP goal, you need to make post-secondary goals measurable. It has to be about what the student will actually do not what they want or what they like or what they think. So it should identify an outcome, not a process. So they will attend school. They will obtain a job. They will ride the bus independently. There needs to be one goal for each adult outcome area at least one. And those areas are education or training. So any educational or training goal that is required to help a student meet their post-school hopes and dreams. And an employment goal, so some goal describing what kind of employment they'll be engaged in. And then finally, an independent living goal, that one is not required. It's only when appropriate. So if a student is doing just fine in terms of their independent living skills, like a student with a learning disability who simply has some academic issues, you don't have to write an independent living goal. But if you have a student who has significant self-care needs, you may need to write some independent living goals. This is a great format for remembering how to write good transition goals.
just like we had a format for writing IEP goals, we have a format for writing transition goals. It should start with after high school or after graduation or upon completion of high school. That helps us keep in mind that we're not writing goals of things that a kid is going to do in school or while they're still in school. We're writing goals for what they are going to do after they leave. Then, of course, the student and then what they will do, a behavior and how or where they will do it. Here's some examples of some post-secondary goals. Here's one in education and training. After graduation, there's that beginning piece, Lily will participate in a center-based program with an adult curriculum focused on gaining maximum social communication, daily living, and vocational skills. Here's an employment goal for Lily. After graduation, Lily will participate in a center-based program with an adult curriculum receiving services to increase her stamina and mobility to prepare her for work. So even if it's not exactly a job that the student will have, if it is after graduation and it is a goal that leads to employment, it could either it could either be an education and training goal or an employment goal. Here's an independent living goal for Lily. After graduation, Lily will use an augmentative communication device at home and the center-based program to communicate her wants, needs, and desires and to interact with her environment more independently. One of the things that you also have to do is you have to note somewhere in the transition plan or in the IEP that the goals have been updated annually. Now, if they're part of an annual IEP, that might be one way to document that you've updated the transition goals or if you date those transition goals um, and that that date changes annually. Here are some examples of some bad post-secondary goals. After leaving high school, Jody wants to take some classes. It's bad because it's not measurable. It's just Jody's desires. Now it may be true that Jody wants to take some classes at a community college or a college or university. But what we need to do in the post-secondary goal is actually describe what she will take. So after leaving high school, Jody will take courses at the community college leading to her preparation as a paraprofessional in education. There are also a requirement that there be age-appropriate transition assessments. And we'll learn more about what those are next week. But here are some examples of statements, and they're not quite like a plaf. Um, they are just statements that are appropriate to the student, and they need to be information that's appropriate for the student's post-secondary goals. So if, if Jamero is a student who wants to work in an auto shop after he leaves the, uh, the high school, um, or wants to intern at an auto shop, it could be that this particular information that's presented isn't exactly appropriate. Here's another example. In this case for Lisette, they use the results of the adaptive behavior checklist, her performance on state assessments, um, and her task list analysis checks during community-based instruction, or her work out in the community. And then anecdotal records could be used also, and portfolio assessments, a physical therapy evaluation. It could be anything that is age appropriate and has some relevant impact on a child's post-school activities. Services is the next important piece. Services could be instructional services, 
any related service, community experiences, um, development of employment or post-school objectives, acquisition of daily living skills or functional vocational evaluations. But it's required that you list some services that are going to help lead a child or a youth toward their post-school goals. Course of study is another required element of a transition assessment. So the course of study is supposed to be aligned with post-secondary goals. In other words, you take a look at the courses that a student will take during their high school career and how they relate to the post-secondary goals and list those courses. Not all courses may apply, so you don't have to list every single course that a student is taking. But you should try to think carefully about the courses that are relevant and impact a student's post-school goals. There are already IEP goals, so a student's not getting a transition plan unless they have an IEP. What you do at age 16 and going forward is you do your best to align their transition goals or their post-school goals to at least one of their IEP goals. And think about the skills and the knowledge a student needs during the academic year to help them meet that post-secondary goal. So if a student has an independent living post-secondary goal, you may have an IEP goal that is helping to teach them those skills. So if a student has a post-secondary goal of Lisette will use the will use an augmentative communication device to communicate her wants and needs at home and at work, then you would have an IEP goal that's related to helping Lisette learn how to use her. And finally, an independent living goal, one that we talked about just a moment ago, Lily using your augmentative communication device. So you should have IEP goals that are also linked to Lily using her augmentative communication device. Another important part of the transition plan, one of those eight important elements, is inviting the student to the meeting. You have to show that for each year when you're going through and updating the IEP, because you update the IEP annually, you update the transition goals annually, you have to show annually that you've invited the student to the meeting. It could be a letter um, that you put in the file. They say no. Um, oh, if they say, say yes. So I guess a letter is OK to have in the student's file. What's not OK is to do it after the fact. I guess what they're saying is here is they want evidence that before the meeting ever took place, you invited the student to the meeting. And that it's not appropriate just to wait to the meeting and check a box that the student is there. You have to show that they were invited. The final element, evidence of coordination. So you have to show in that transition plan somewhere and somehow that there are transition services um, for outside that include outside agencies. Now that there actually don't have to be outside agencies involved. But if you include outside agencies, you can't just name people and then not include them in the transition planning. If you're going to include an outside agency, you have to show that you've invited them um, and that there is some evidence that they are helping to coordinate services. So in this case, for Lily, they got consent 
from Lily's mother um, to have contact with Voc Rehab. If you remember back to our FERPA discussion, this is an important piece so that you can share educational information with Voc Rehab and that they can share information about Lily to you. So one more time to walk through the important pieces of the Indicator 13 checklist or the important pieces of a transition plan are measurable post-secondary goals that are updated annually, that are age appropriate, So one more time, let's walk through the important elements of a transition plan. You have to have post-secondary goals that are measurable. They have to be updated annually. They have to be based on age-appropriate assessments. There should be services that are aligned with those post-secondary goals to help kids meet their goals. You should show how the courses that a student is taking in high school are aligned with the post-secondary goals. You should have at least one IEP goal aligned with each post-secondary goal. There should be some evidence the student was invited to the IEP and there should be some evidence of coordination. We'll take a look at some samples in another video and I'll show you how to use a, uh, a checklist developed by the NSTTAC, this National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, um, how to use a checklist of these indicators to walk through a transition plan and ensure that it's complete.